Before we start the video, make sure to subscribe to my channel. I appreciate all the support I received from you. And as always, all the information in my videos is rumors taken from the internet or the street, I'm not saying the information is fact. The Story of D-Rose Slash 600, Part 3 This is the third part of the story of D-Rose and the story of 600. However, now we have left D-Rose behind as his story ended in the second part. This part will take place from the summer of 2014 to the tragic murder of Edie in August 2021. I will detail the murder of Lil Boo, go through both theories of the murder of Bebe from Mob, by Down's case, the murders during the Get Back Gang era where 600 were highly involved, Mikado's case, the murder of Ide and much more. We begin this story with a very disputable murder, namely the murder of Lil Scrap from Mob. The reason why there is so much discussion about this case is because there are various theories circulating about who and which gang was actually behind the murder. As most of you by now already know, Lil Scrap was one of Mob's absolute top young members at the time. He was allegedly involved in multiple murders, including the murder of Memo 600's brother, Lil Steve from 600 which we went through in part 1 of this story. Just as I have previously told, Lil Scrap was even arrested and charged with that murder but was later acquitted due to lack of evidence. However, Lil Scrap wasn't the only one arrested for the murder, Moochie from Mob was also charged but was also later released. It has also been rumored that Lil Scrap was involved in the murder of Baldy from 600 as well as Fred from Dodge City. However, I believe both of these rumors are false. First of all, I think Baldy was killed by STL slash EBT. Secondly, there is information that Scrap was locked up when Fred was murdered. Nevertheless, Lil Scrap was a known face, shooter, killer and he was not shy with the mockery on Twitter. He was also known for having shot L.A. Capone in the leg in the year 2012. In 2014, however, it was Lil Scrappy's turn to fall victim to the savage gun violence in Chicago. On June 7th, Scrap was standing in an alley on the 5600 block of South Wabash Avenue, which is considered mob territory. He wasn't alone. He was standing together with Moochie from Mob whom he was allegedly accompanied with when he allegedly killed Lil Steve from 600 in 2011. While standing in the alley, a black car pulled up. Two men jumped out of the car and ran into the alley towards Lil Scrap and Moochie with loaded guns, aiming towards the two. The offenders started letting a dozen of shots and both Lil Scrap and Moochie ended up getting hit multiple times. Sadly. Lil Scrap was pronounced dead at the scene when paramedics arrived. Moochie, however, was taken to the John H. Stroger Jr. Hospital of Cook County in critical condition and miraculously survived and is still alive to this day. After the murder, the police interviewed witnesses who said to have seen a black vehicle speeding from the scene. Just like I mentioned earlier, there are several theories about who and what gang was actually behind the murder of Lil Scrap and the attempted murder of Moochie. At first, everything pointed to 600 being behind the murder as part of the war between 600 and Mob and revenge for the murder of Lil Steve. This theory stemmed mostly from incriminating tweets from members of 600. Also, if I remember correctly, this theory first came out during the old Chicago Basement Wiki files. However, those documents are mostly filled with false and outdated information, which means that one cannot imply that that source is credible. However, there are still things that point to it being 600. We've all heard the line by Ruga from Mob in the song, Exposing Me, where he rapped, Do it for scrap, we made 600 change blocks which has been reposted several times by Mob members. Lil Boo from 600, who for a long time was rumored to have been one of the killers, was also mocked by Ruga throughout the song. Then we've also heard King Bun and Memo 600 mocking Lil Scrap throughout their careers. Cap FCK12 has also mocked Lil Scrap multiple times on social media, as have many other 600 members. The two members from 600 who for years have been rumored to have been involved in the murder are Lil Boo who was later killed a year later, and Zhu Blow 600, 
who is currently locked up for a murder which we will come to later in the story. However, I will now break down why this theory is most likely not true and why most of the evidence points towards Shields. First of all, the theory of 600 killing Lil Scrap fails at the very beginning of the rumors as the theory is based on tweets, that Lil Boo was killed a year later and that Zhu Blow 600 was admitted to OTF. Already five years ago, De Capone commented on an Instagram page that Zhu Blow has never killed anyone from mob, and also stated that it is difficult to kill someone from the mob, a goofy can't do it. However, at this point, Take Capone had an agenda towards Zhu Blo since he did not like him, so it could be possible that he's lying. But on the other hand, he put it on L.A. Capone which makes it more credible. Another thing, Scrappy's father has on multiple occasions hinted that it was Shields who killed his son. On his birthday in 2018, his father made a Facebook post where he wrote, F. Shields. Both his father and members of Mob have also stated they are GDK for Scrap, which indicates that it was Shields who was behind the murder. However, what perhaps most indicates that it was actually Shields who killed Scrap is that Lonnie B from Shields made a song where he mocks Scrap throughout the song. In the comments section below this video, a fan asks why Shields are claiming Scrap when it was 600 who killed him. Lonnie B actually answered this comment by writing, Stop it, we caught Scrap in that alley, and, F Scrap, now you know the truth. What's strange is that no names have come out from Shields who might have been involved. It may be because their members are not as famous and therefore there are not as many who pin bodies on them like they do on 600's more famous members. However, I am not saying which of these theories is correct, even if I personally believe it was Shields there is still a possibility that it was 600. Lil D from 600 even claimed to be one of the killers of Scrap in a tweet where he wrote, F Lil Scrap, Lil D Maker. There are several different examples of members from both sides claiming Lil Scrap, that's why it's hard to know who it actually was. 600 have the most credit for the hit but that is mostly because they are famous and make music. What is clear is that it is a side that lies, and you must also be clear that even Scrap's family can lie, just like the family of FBG ducted after his passing. There is family of Scrap, his father for example, who say Shields did it, then there is his brother, Lay, saying it was 600, and if I remember correctly, Lonnie B, who I talked about earlier, even withdrew his statement about them killing Scrap, maybe because he was snitching too much with his statement but it still confuses. My personal belief is that we will never find out who or who was actually behind the murder, the only thing we can do is speculate which is not really of much use. Just a few weeks later, 600 was responsible for the murder of a member from 051 Young Money. Michael Potton, also known as Polo, and a 15-year-old friend were walking around in 051 territory when a van suddenly pulled up next to them. The people inside the van started talking to Polo, suddenly someone inside the van started opening fire on Polo and his friend. Tragically, Polo, who was only 17 years old, was pronounced dead at the scene after getting struck with multiple bullets in his chest. The 15-year-old luckily managed to escape after being hit in the right arm. According to the rumors I've heard, there were four or five members from 600 on this hit. The names that have been mentioned to me are, Lil Boo, Zhu Blo, Face and Blast His Ass. Of these people, there is one that has basically been confirmed as the one who pulled the trigger and that person is Lil Boo. This is confirmed by both friends and family of Polo who have released this information on various forums. As everyone knows Lil Boo was one of 600's top members so it can't really surprise anyone that he was the one behind the shooting. The crime scene was truly gruesome. There is a picture, which of course I won't show here, where Polo is lying on the ground in the dark with a blanket over him with one arm out and the rain pouring down on him. There is a very good text written about this very thing by the journalist Michael Lansu, who was the first on the scene after the murder when he lived on the street. I will therefore paste and read the text for you in this video. The text is quite long and will be three slides, but I think it is absolutely worth reading, you really get a completely different perspective and view of the horror that takes place every day in Chicago. At my son's fifth birthday party on Sunday, a friend asked me if my block was noisy. 
I replied as I always do, no. It's a quiet, tree-lined, one-way street. But Monday night was different. I found myself barefoot, ankle-deep in water, holding the hand of a 17-year-old boy who had been shot during the downpour. I told him to hang in there and that the ambulance was on the way. I don't know the exact time, but the thunder and lightning were constant, the rain was coming down in buckets and the wind was blowing hard. I had been watching the storm through an open second floor window that faces south onto 50th place. Shortly after I went to the basement to check my 116-year-old house for flooding, I heard three loud cracks. When I looked out the window, I saw a teenage boy running through the yard across the street yelling for help. I couldn't see what happened from the window, but I assumed that a large tree branch had fallen on a car, possibly trapping someone inside. I ran downstairs, opened the front door and saw what I thought was a man laying face up in the gutter of the partially flooded street. I ran upstairs to tell my wife to call 911, which she was already doing. Then we both grabbed our raincoats and a flashlight. Two other teenagers were near the man, who was lying motionless in the gutter when we went outside to help. One boy stood quiet and motionless, the other paced back and forth saying, they shot my brother. Then he picked up some of his brother's belongings from the street, as if he didn't know what else to do. I leaned over the wounded teen and checked his left wrist for a pulse but felt nothing. Then I pressed my fingers against his neck, but before I could find a pulse, his entire body twitched and gasped for air. I now knew he was still alive, but I didn't know what to do to help. It was dark, there was water everywhere and a nearby street lamp and my flashlight were the only lights around. My wife came out with a towel to stop any bleeding but the rain and the dark pool of water made it impossible to find the wound. I unzipped his fleece jacket, which revealed bare skin and a bullet wound in his right chest. There was no blood coming out, just white tissue that made the wound look like a belly button. A few neighbors came outside, and that's when I noticed a gun on the curb just feet from the boy. I told a neighbor to stand over the gun and make sure nobody picked it up. I wasn't sure who did the shooting, but I knew that emotions were high, and I didn't want to provide an opportunity for a second attack while I was around. I mostly stayed close to the wounded teen as he lay on his back, arms spread, knees bent like Jesus on an invisible cross. He wasn't gasping for air much anymore, and my wife, who has a medical background, went into the house to search for a respiratory mask. I waited outside holding his hand, occasionally looking up to check for an ambulance or the police. The crowd gathered around was starting to wonder aloud, where is the ambulance? Where are the police? A few cars drove past, and the occupants rolled down the windows and gasped. It felt like forever, but I knew it had probably been less than five minutes since we called 911. I looked back down at the teen and grabbed his hand again. I don't remember if I said anything else to him, but I know I patted him on the back of the hand as I looked toward his face. His big brown eyes remained wide open as if he was afraid to close them as he looked up into the tree branches. I stood up and looked down the block, hoping for an ambulance. When I saw a police SUV about a block away I waved my flashlight up and down. The SUV spotlight shone down the block through a light rain as they approached. I looked back at the teen and hoped he'd pull through, although I knew just by looking at him that he was no longer alive. He was motionless with his big eyes staring up into the rain. As a professional photographer and photojournalist, I am used to being ready to document news at the drop of a hat. I've been to a few crime scenes over the years, and even put myself at risk to photograph a fire in the apartment next door. When I first walked out the door, a part of me thought about going back inside and getting my camera. But I remembered what a great teacher once told me. You're a human first and a photojournalist second. I wrestled with the idea of taking photos right after police and paramedics arrived, but it didn't feel right. It wasn't until the police tape was set and a blanket placed over the teen that the scene began to look like the crime scenes I was used to. Except this time I had a vantage point from my front door. I could say I took a few photos because that is what I do but really I took them because I needed to be able to put a lens between me and the reality at all of our front doors. Now we leave the year 2014 and move instead to the year 2015, 
a year when 600 lost two very important members, King Lil Bu and Stello. As most people know, King Lil Bu is one of the founders and original members of 600, he is also one of the members who put in most work on the street. The opposition was keen to get him out of the way. On April 3, 2015, they took the chance and succeeded. On this day, King Lil Bu was standing in the 5800 block of South King Drive when a gold-colored vehicle pulled up, one individual from the car started shooting at Lil Bu who tried to hide behind another car. The shooter then got out of the car and walked up to Lil Bu who was attempting to hide under the parked car, but it was too late, the shooter shot him multiple times at close range. Lil Bu was left laying on the ground with his head next to the tire, hence the opposition mocked him after the murder by calling him Tire Head. Lil Bu, whose real name was Jerome Anderson, was taken to Northwestern Memorial Hospital, where he was pronounced dead 30 minutes after the shooting at only 22 years of age. A police source said the man killed, Jerome Anderson, was a documented gang member, and was on parole at the time of the shooting. It has long been speculated who exactly jumped out of the car and shot him at close range. According to the latest information that has come out through police reports, it was a lone shooter who got out of the car. However, it was not just one member on the hit, it has been speculated that there were multiple people on the hit and from different sets. The gangs that have been speculated to have been present are 051 Young Money, Mob and Jaro City. Before we get to the speculations about who actually shot, we seem to at least have a clear picture of who the driver was, namely Ario from 051 Young Money. Ario was actually charged with the murder of Lil Boo the same day it happened after getting arrested in a parking lot in the same car that was used on the hit a few hours earlier, a white Hyundai Sonata. However, the charges were later dropped for lack of evidence. A month later, Ario would get arrested for another murder, the murder of Rahim from THF 46, the stepson of THF Bay Zoo. Ario, who is still locked up, tried to blame the murder of Rahim on Sonny from 757 who was shot and killed two weeks after Rahim. Ario is a known snitch, he has also told police that Bay Zoo from THF killed his sister Big Gay in 2013. It has long been speculated who was actually present on the hit. The names that have been mentioned are Bebe from Mob, Mota from Jaro City, and Melly, Ario and Uchi from 051 Young Money. However, many claim Bebe wasn't present at the murder due to him allegedly being locked up at the time. The member who has been singled out the most as the sole shooter is Uchi from 051. However, other claims it was not Uchi who did it. Some also believe Melly was the sole shooter due to a Facebook post Lil Boo's sister made after his death on the 1st of September 2019 where she wrote, Tell Lil Boo what up, followed by smoke emojis. We have also seen several tweets from Melly where he mocked Lil Boo. For example, just two weeks after the murder, Melly posted a tweet where he wrote, I'm in traffic smoking Lil Boo. Some people have even said Motor was the shooter. But if we are to sum up this chaos of different theories, my personal belief is that there were four people present on the hit, Ario was the driver and the three other people were Motor from Jaro City and Melly and Uchi from 051 Young Money. After that, the opinions diverge and there is really no point in trying to find the truth about who was the shooter as it is really impossible to prove. What confuses this situation even more is that some members from 600 claim Lil Boo's killer is dead while others, like Breezy, have stated it's one left. In the song, Let Em Know, by Buka 600 featuring Lil Zayo Sama which was released in 2019, Buka raps, caught Lil Boo killer out in traffic, let him have it. However, when this song was released, Tristo from 051 made a story, mocking the lyrics, and wrote, He's good, followed by laughing emojis. In December last year, 600 Breezy posted a story on his Instagram which was a picture of himself and Lil Boo along with the text, It's one dude left, we sent the rest to you, he ain't got long. 600 Breezy is known to have lied about a lot of things but I don't see any reasons why he would lie about this. However, a huge part of his story does not make sense, he wrote, We sent the rest to you.
implying that 600 or their allies killed three of the four people on the hit. Aria from 051 is still alive and Meli was killed by Taekwon World. The only one they got of the four speculated names is Motor, who was allegedly killed by THF-46. However, it must be said that Breezy may be right and that it is us on the outside who have singled out the wrong members. As many of you already know, Lil Bu is an incredibly important and prominent figure within 600. He is considered to be the member who together with D-Thang formed 600 in 2009. The real reason it was created is because D-Thang's older brothers, Chief Domo and Trigger, would not let him claim Brick City due to his young age at the time. D-Thang and Lil Bu therefore decided to create their own thing, with them as captains of the team, 600. Other than being one of the creators of 600, Lil Bu was also widely known to be a killer and a shooter with bodies under his belt. However, it is highly debated which murders he was actually involved in. Many have speculated about Polo from 051 Young Money as I have talked about earlier in this video. This rumor have been confirmed by members but also by Polo's own cousin. Other names that have been speculated about are Big B from Taekwon World, Lil Scrap from Mob as well as being present at the murders of Hadi from Jaro City, Javon the Taxi Driver and Mojo from No Law whom Young Famous from 600 allegedly killed. I'm not saying that these rumors are true. I'm just telling you which names have been speculated. I'm sure Lil Boo had old bodies we don't know about. However, one murder that we can debunk is the murder of Crystal from Mob, Lil Boo nor D Thang killed her, according to the police report it was a black pea stone who killed her. What is very sad is that six years after Lil Boo was murdered, his father and brother were also murdered only two weeks apart. His father, also named Jerome Anderson, was shot and killed on February 20th, 2021. Jerome, also called Big Boo, was found lying face up next to his vehicle in the 2000 block of West 79th Street. He had been shot in the back of his neck and was taken to Christ Medical Center in Oaklawn, where he was pronounced dead. Why he was murdered is unknown. Just like I mentioned, just two weeks later, Lil Boo's brother, Ja Ja, was murdered on March 5th. 2021. Jaja, ja, or Jahim Anderson, was shot in the 1000 block of East 59th place by an unknown gunman. Jaja ja claimed both cut a gang and 600. Who killed him is currently unknown. What is certain, however, is that all three are reunited in a better place. After the murder of Lil Boo, 600 and O block were out for revenge and since there were two or three gangs present on the hit, members of Jaro City, Mob and 051 Young Money were all acceptable targets. It would take several months before 600 managed to get revenge and that murder is not even certain that 600 was behind it. However, before the 600 retaliated, they lost another important member just three months after Lil Boo's murder. The murder I am referring to is of course the murder of Stella from 600. On July 21st, 2015, Stella from 600 was sitting in a silver charger along with two other members. Stella and the others were driving southbound in the 5900 block of South State which is considered as mob territory. While driving around in the area, mob members who were outside on the street recognized the car and Stella. Someone even shouted that Stella was inside the car. Members from mob then quickly entered a red vehicle and started following and catching up to Stella's car. Once the silver charger stopped at a red light, the mob members in the red vehicle took their chance and pulled up next to the silver charger. Three individuals then got out of their vehicle and started shooting up the silver charger. However, two individuals from the charger instantly got out of the car and started shooting back at the mob members. However, it was too late, as you all know, events like these are over in seconds, Stello, who was sitting in the back seat was already hit multiple times including in the head. The mob members quickly retreated back into their vehicle and sped off, as did the two individuals in the charger who had returned fire. Stello, whose real name was Cass Singleton, was pronounced dead on the scene. He was only 26 years old. According to Takeopone, Stella was the link between the older and the younger members, that is members from Brick Squad and 600. 
What's crazy is that it wasn't just people from the red car who shot. According to the murder report it was also people standing on the sidewalk who shot and people who emerged from an alley who let off shots. Their car was basically flipped from three different places at the same time, it was basically a miracle that not everyone in the car died. Stello has been mocked several times on social media and in music, not least by Ruga from Mob who rapped the famous line, Stello got hit from the back of the seat. Damn, the back of the seat? He tried to get up from the back of the seat, they left his head in the back of the seat. And Drilla from 051 Young Money is another member who has mocked Stello on multiple occasions. In his famous song 51 Dead OPPS, he rapped, Stello tried to pull off, then bullets were faster. He also mocked him in the song They Lion, where he rapped, Flame up Stello right now, the light was red referring to the fact that Stello and the others stopped at a red light when he was killed. In the murder report, a name was pointed out as one of the shooters in the murder of Stello. That person was a boy from Mob who was killed a year later which we will come to later in the story. A boy was positively identified by witnesses, however there was not enough evidence to charge him with the murder. Instead, he was murdered a year later. However, when it comes to the other shooters, it is more unknown who exactly fired. What makes it extra difficult is that there were people who shot from three different places, the red car, the alley and sidewalk. However, there is one name that has been mentioned several times in connection with the murder that I have heard was involved and that is Bebe from the mob. What's crazy is that just like a boy, Bebe was also murdered a year later. A few days after the murder of Bebe, Breezy from 600 posted a tweet where he wrote, Stella the Great, rest up. Bebe, Wookie and Scrap by the Zip, followed by a cigarette butt emoji. Stella was a very beloved member of 600, he was close with everyone. That's one of the reasons why he gets mocked, 600's enemies knew it hurt them. But that wasn't the only reason why he was hated. Stella was also a shooter, he was on plenty of hits and was active already in the early 2000s. For example, around the year 2010, Dome from Jara City got shot by Stello while trying to slide on Brick City. One more small detail that is very interesting in the case of Stello happened in an interview with Ide, Young Famous and Zhu Blow that Zach TV uploaded on May 8, 2015, just a few weeks before the murder. At the end of the interview, a car comes driving at high speed near where the interview took place, Zhu Blow immediately runs up with his hand in his pocket. There was no time to fire any bullets because 600 immediately realized that it was not an enemy but Stello who was passing by. Zach TV actually managed to record the car as well but stopped quite quickly when Ida told him not to record any cars. You also hear a voice in the background saying that it is Stello's car. What's interesting about this is that the car Stello was driving was the same car he was driving around the day he was murdered. This leads to the question if it was from this video that the mob got intel about which vehicle Stello was driving. Of course, it does not have to be the case that the mob found out through this video, but it is clearly an interesting detail. In a side note before we move on to 600, I want to tell you about the murder of Booby from Jaro City. Booby whose real name was Shaquandra Ratliff, was shot in the head at an outdoor party in an alley in the 6100 block of South Cottage Grove. She was only 20 years old but despite her young age, she was an infamous member of Jaro City, however not because of her street reputation, because she actually had one, but because she was the girlfriend of Lil Boo from 600 and was carrying his son when she died. Now you might be wondering how and why a girl from Jaro City was with a member from 600, well, Booby was just cool with people from both sides. For example she was very close with D Thang, Breezy and Trigger. However, despite this, there were even rumors that she let off shots towards 600 a couple of times. Booby was also known for her tweets. Her Twitter account was basically a diary of her life, she tweeted about everything happening in her life. For example, in one tweet, she wrote, Let me sneak Lil Boo out of here because Duck, Dusky and Yarmul Fendo kill him. Previously, it was believed that 800 was behind the murder of Booby at the outside party, however, this is not true. 
In fact, Booby died in the crossfire in a shootout between Taekwon World and 051 Young Money. Whether it was intentional or by mistake is unknown, but Booby's little sister has stated it was Taekwon World and Jaro City who shot her, and that it was by accident. The person who has previously been suspected of the shooting is Lil Fats from 800, this information has been debunked and 800 themselves have denied being involved. Immediately after the shooting, 800 and TW Jaro City began to incite each other on Twitter. There were also internal conflicts in TW Jaro about the murder because Booby was very loved. Even many members from 600 and O Block were deprived because some of them were close. Booby also hung out with King Von's sister Kayla B at some point. Booby was basically in the mix in a lot of socializing. Many from O Block and 600 refrained from mocking her after her death, not only because many were friends with her, but also because she was carrying Lil Boo's son in her stomach when she died. We now leave the year 2015, a difficult year for 600, and instead enter the year 2016. 2016 turned it around, it would be a year where 600's enemies had a hard time, not necessarily because of 600, but because of other circumstances. We start with the murder of Bebe from Mob, one of the alleged killers of Stella which we talked about earlier. There is a lot of controversy surrounding this murder because there is one side that says that 600 was behind the murder while the other side says that Bebe was backdoored by Wanda World which he also claimed. I will break down both of these theories and the possibilities behind them. Before I get into the theories, I first want to tell you how it happened because even that is complicated. On June 14, 2016, Bay Bay was riding in a dark colored 2009 Range Rover with other mob members, including Nut. While driving on the 6500 block of South Ross Avenue, which is considered Lamron territory, they spotted a white car parked on the side of the road. A man next to the white car was filling up his car with gas from a can since it had run out, according to a witness nearby. For some reason, Bay Bay and the other pulled up next to this car and at some point, the man filling up his car and Bay Bay started arguing for unknown reasons. At this point, the witness nearby left the scene and went back to her house, and it was at that point she suddenly heard five to seven shots fired. Once she dared to go out again, which was approximately 10 minutes later, the dark colored Range Rover was still there but the car that was earlier out of gas, was gone. While she was away, the argument had heated up between Bay Bay and the man filling up his car. It all ended with Bay Bay getting shot in the hand and head with several shots by the man next to the white car. Bay Bay was still in his car when this happened, apparently in the driving seat since he was shot in the left side of the head and he was found in the middle of the driving seat and front passenger seat, apparently in the midst of trying to escape the bullets by getting to the back seats of the car. Now I will explain the first theory. The one that hit the internet first. The first theory says that it was DSG and 600 who killed him, more specifically, Bite Down and Wu Tang. This theory came out before the police report came out and before the internet found Facebook posts from people who said he was backdoored. Much of this theory stems from tweets by Wu Tang from Duke Squad, who uploaded several self-incriminating posts after the murder. There was of course also the motive that supported this theory that 600 got back for Stello who allegedly got killed by Bebe a year earlier. An hour before the murder, Wu Thang posted a tweet saying, got my poker face on, I'm going all in. This was also his last post before the murder. After the murder, he tweeted a bunch of laughing emojis. Breezy from 600 also uploaded a post after the murder where he wrote, Stella the Great, rest up. Bebe, Wookie, scrapped by the zip, Two years later, in June 2018, Spot News made a post about a vehicle getting shot up near mob territory. Memo from 600 commented on this post saying, Ain't hit shit for Bay Bay, followed by two laughing emojis and two skulls. My guess is that 600 slid on mob this day and got their car shot at. However, this is two years later which doesn't have to mean anything, Memo may be just trolled which he is mostly famous for. Bite Down is mostly suspected because he was very close with Wu Tang. There are videos of them sliding together that year and a couple of weeks after the murder, he
he wrote a tweet about sliding keeping bite down with him bite down also had dreads which also the offender had according to the witness the second theory says that it was a member from Wagga World who shot Bay Bay, however, who specifically is unknown. This rumor stems from several people saying Bay Bay was backdoored and that Wagga World was behind it. Rico Reckless, who earlier claimed Wagga World, actually talked about this in an interview with Cam Capone News where he mentioned that no one wants to say who killed Bay Bay because he was backdoored. Another event that possibly supports this theory is that Bebe Bay was a suspect in a double homicide at a house party in Wagga World Territory two months before he was murdered. According to the police, Bebe Bay was not allowed in at the party, he then came back with a gun and opened fire, killing two people and injuring one 45-year-old. The two he killed were named Pierre Payne, 32, and Andrew Haynes, 34. The reason why I said that this event could possibly support the backdoor theory is because some people have claimed that at least one of the victims was affiliated with Wugga World. However, there are some who claim they weren't affiliated with them. What is true is hard to know as it is hard to find information about them. It is also difficult to know if it was Bay Bay's intended targets, hit the wrong target or if he just shot at people at the party randomly. In summary, there is a lot of evidence that supports both of the theories. Then of course there are other theories, to be snake does not have to mean that a member from Wagga World pulled the trigger. It could just as well mean that he was set up by one of his own or that they gave away his location. This is a long stretch but it might just as well have been that the man who filled up his gas, acted as a distraction, knew Bay Bay and called him for help, but instead he set him up to be killed by 600. This is probably not true and is a far stretch, but I want you to understand that a lot may have happened during the time the witness wasn't present. One thing that stuck out to me as significant evidence was that Bebe and the suspected offender were arguing. There is no way on earth that 600 would have argued with him, it would have been on sight from both sides if Bite Down stood next to the white car. It's really hard what to make of these theories. I think I've laid them out well for you and therefore let you viewers decide what you think sounds most likely. In the end it's only tragic, Bay Bay, despite being a ruthless murderer, was only 18 years old when he was murdered. A month earlier, Pyro from 800 was killed by Bay Bay's brother, Doma from Mob which he ended up getting arrested for and sentenced to life in prison. Before we move on to the murder of the second alleged killer of Stello, a boy, I just want to mention the murder of Twink from Jaro City. Twink, whose real name was Marshawn Jackson, was shot and killed on June 16, 2016, in the 6300 block of South Eberhart which is considered Taekwon World slash Jaro City territory. According to the newspaper, Twink was shot in the face and was taken to the Northwestern Memorial Hospital in serious condition where he later passed away at the age of 27. The reason I mention this murder is because O Block was behind it. It was a lone gunman, around 5.7 with dreads who shot Twink and then ran towards Parkway Apartments which is O Block. The member who has been most singled out for this murder is Ed Dog from O Block, a well-known member and shooter. This event is important since this murder allegedly broke the ongoing truce between Taekwon World slash Jaro City and O Block in 2016. There is actually an article about this trick you can read if you want. This later led to the murder of D-Roy which would be the beginning of Get Back Gang which 600 also was a part of. It should also be said that Get Back Gang was already a thing after Bigga died in December of 2016, but the enemies did not kill him hence the revenge came first after T-Roy died. Now we come to the murder of a boy from Mob. Just as I mentioned earlier. A boy was listed as a suspect in the murder of Stello. A boy, whose real name was Eric Banks, was walking together with Boosie from Mob on the 5700 block of South Wabash when man jumped out of a car and started shooting at the two. Boosie managed to react faster, and sprint faster, but a boy who first got shot and then stumbled, got stood over and finished with several rounds in the back. The shooter then ran back to the car and was seen speeding away. Boosie came out of the situation unscattered, but a boy was pronounced dead at the hospital at the age of 25. This murder is on film, but it is not something I will show, 
nor do I recommend any of you to watch it. Now many may believe that it was 600 who were behind this murder, but it was not, it was THF 46. The two specifically responsible were Westbrook, Tate and Gucci from THF 46, where the latter was the gunman and was sentenced to 55 years for the murder. This was a very sloppy hit by THF, firstly, Gucci did not even wear a mask and Tate used his own car as the getaway vehicle. The license plate was read by one of those plate recognizers, so it was a fairly simple job for the police. The job didn't get any harder after both Boosie from Mob and Westbrook from THF pointed out both Gucci and Tate. It is even rumored that Westbrook took the stand at the trial and pointed out Gucci after receiving $10,000 from the feds. Gucci will be released in 2075. Now we have come to a horrific part of the story and it is of course the massacre that Bite Down carried out on an innocent family. This situation is unimaginable to understand, how someone could do such a thing is just beyond me, under the influence of drugs or not. According to prosecutors, Bite Down, 19, began dating a girl named Amani House, 20, in the summer of 2015 which was a year before the massacre took place. Bite Down whose real name is Daryl Benton Harris, became a fixture at House's South Chicago home until the month of May 2016, when Amani gave birth to the couple's first child, according to Assistant State's attorney Becky Walters. Bite Down and Amani saw each other sporadically after the baby's birth, prosecutors said, and soon enough, Amani found herself pregnant with the couple's second child. On November 3, 2016, Amani was four months along with their child, Bite Down visited the house's family home in the 8000 block of South South Shore Drive sometime after midnight. Amani lived with her five-month-old daughter, her mother and her four younger siblings. A 29-year-old family friend was also visiting that evening, prosecutors said, and the entire family disliked Bite Down because of how he treated Amani. At some point during Bite Down's visit, he got into an argument with Amani's young brother, 16-year-old Elijah. The argument soon escalated to a physical fight which Bite Down apparently lost. According to prosecutors, Bite Down then left the home but returned a short while later with a gun. Once he got back, he instantly started shooting the younger brother, Elijah, in front of his 42-year-old mother. Bite Down then turned towards the mother and as she was trying to run away, he fired multiple shots striking her in the back which caused her to collapse. Seconds later, Bite Down turned to his girlfriend, Amani, and proceeded to kill her and their unborn baby. By that point, the 42-year-old mother had begun crawling away despite her injuries and that's when Bite Down decided to shoot her once more. The mother then played dead for the remainder of the massacre. In total, the mother was shot five times in her back, buttocks, left thigh and right breast, and survived. Bite Down was not done here, because he then turned his attention towards the family's 29-year-old friend, who tried to hide in a bathroom. The woman was shot in her neck, back and leg, and survived. Bite Down left alone his five-month-old daughter and the other children in the house and then fled the scene, according to prosecutors. The fact that more people didn't die during this massacre is nothing short of a miracle. A week after the massacre, Bite Down was arrested following a routine traffic stop. According to an arrest report, police pulled over a car in which Bite Down was the passenger because he and the driver were not wearing seat belts. Bite Down gave officers a fake name and the men were soon allowed to leave. But as the driver pulled away near 63rd and California, he cut off traffic and began driving erratically. Officers followed the car until it stopped a few blocks away and the men stepped out of the car. Bite Down looked towards the police with his hands in his pockets. When they asked him to show his hands, Bite Down replied, F no, and took off running. Since officers believed Bite Down was armed, they chased him and used a taser. He was carrying six bags of marijuana but no weapon. Police soon learned Bite Down's true identity. He was wanted on an arrest warrant for the murders of Amani and Elijah House. Amani House, who was four months pregnant, had been fatally shot in her right flank, right breast and mouth. Elijah, meanwhile, was fatally shot in his back. 
Bite Down, who was homeless at the time, was charged with first-degree murder, attempted first-degree murder, resisting police, obstructing identification, possession of marijuana, reckless conduct, aggravated battery by discharging a firearm and intentional homicide of an unborn child. To this date, Bite Down is still waiting on getting sentenced. Now we enter the year 2017, a very hectic year. This was the year that Get Back Gang became a thing. In order not to sound too repetitive, I will not go into all the murders in detail as I have done so in several other videos. On Valentine's Day, February 14th, 2017, one of Roblox's most famous members and perhaps the member who put in the most work, together with King Von, was murdered. I am of course referring to the murder of T-Roy. T-Roy was walking in the 2000 block of East 71st Street in the South Shore area, allegedly looking for TB. TB had several pictures of him standing on the exact street and especially outside a sports shop on that street. That day, T-Roy was out by himself looking for TB and decided to go to the street where he had seen pictures of TB to see if he was there. It is then rumored to have been Brick from STL slash EBT who spotted him and called TB to give him T-Roy's location. It was no wonder that it was Brick who spotted T-Roy because Brick, just like TB, lived in Paxtown around that time. When TB got the call, he picked up two times and can't get right and went to the location, but T-Roy, who was on full alert since he was lurking, spotted them and upped his gun on them and tried to chase them down. TB and the others ran and got away and went to their apartment, grabbed guns and dressed up completely black. They went back to the location and spotted T-Roy going into a grocery store on that street. TB along with Can't Get Right went inside the store. On the surveillance footage you can even see T-Roy standing next to Can't Get Right and TB. Second later, TB upped his gun and shot T-Roy once in the chest. Both TB and CGR rushed out of the store and fled the scene. The police knew exactly who it was who shot D-Roy due to surveillance footage and witnesses but somehow, D.B. never managed to get charged with the murder despite all the evidence the police had. The whole hit went down like a cat and rat game. This was a huge loss for not only a block but also 600 since D-Roy was extremely close to them. After this murder, both O-Block and 600 had one focus, getting disproportionate revenge. Their aim was to kill everyone involved in the murder and any member of Mob, Jaro City, Taekwon World and STL slash EBT. It was after the murder of D-Roy, that Buka from 600 posted the infamous tweet where he wrote, Y'all don't know the half of what's finna transpire. With TB killing D-Roy, he pretty much signed his own death warrant. He was alive while his friends were murdered left and right and he knew his time would come. It was only a matter of time. A month after the murder of D-Roy, OB-600 would drop the first body in their act of revenge. Lil Ho, an older member of Jaro City, was found dead on a sidewalk in the 6100 block of South Eberhardt. According to authorities, he had been shot multiple times in the head. The one responsible for this hit was allegedly OB-600 and there have been several names surrounding this murder. The names who have been mentioned are, Mac Otto from 600 and E-Dog, Gleesh, Trey 5, Duke and HK, all from O Block. Now I don't think everyone was present at the hit but it gives you an idea of who might have been involved. What is known is that the same gun that was used in the murder of Jamo from Mob. Mac Otto was actually arrested with this gun which could mean he was involved in the murder of Jamo as well, which occurred 8 days after the murder of Lil Ho. However, it is quite common that guns get passed around, I have heard both Mac Otto and Duke names being involved in the murder of Jamo, who did what is probably hard to figure out since these weapons are getting passed around a lot and Mac Otto was of course not charged with either of the murders. My guess is that OB600 was sharing guns a lot during 2017 and the following year. As I previously mentioned, Lil Ho was an older member, 44 years of age and was actually the father of Rare from Jaro City. Rare was locked up when his father was killed. As said, eight days after the murder of Lil Ho, OB-600 dropped the second body on their enemies, Jamo from Mob. Jamo, whose real name was Jamie Jones, 
was driving west in the 200 block of West 59th Street, which is close to mob territory. In the crossing, at the lights, another vehicle pulled up alongside Jamo's car and started shooting, striking him in the chest, back and arm. Jamo was taken to Stroger Hospital, where he died about four hours later. Those rumored to be present on this hit are Mac Otto, Face and Cap Fuck 12 from 600, and Duke from Oblock. A theory that has long been rumored is that they followed Jamo's car out of mob territory until they got the perfect chance to kill him. Jamo was the older brother of Lil Main from Front Street who was shot in the face by TB from Taekwon World in 2016 and survived. He is also the older brother of Scooty, also from Front Street. Already in 2010, Jamo was close to losing his life after leaving a restaurant together with his girlfriend Crystal. A gunman, allegedly D. Thang from 600, started shooting, aiming at Jamo, but instead he hit Crystal and Jamo managed to escape. Crystal did unfortunately not survive. Two other men were shot in the situation and luckily survived. After the murders, E. Dog posted a tweet that read, 2017 a lot of get back gang. It's going to be a cold ass summer. Three weeks later it was time again. A third body would hit the ground. This time it was TB's best friend, Poppy from Taekwon World, who would lose his life. Despite Poppy being heavily involved in the gang life, he got a job at the L&P Wholesale Candy Company which is located in the 7000 block of South State which is considered DOD territory. DOD are BDs who are cool with Front Street. Why Poppy chose to work in a BD territory is hard to know, especially during this time when O Block and 600 were constantly out for blood. Some people say Taekwon World underestimated O Block's desire for revenge after the murder of T Roy. Anyway, on June 16, 2017, Poppy was at work. A witness, an older lady, stated she had been shopping at the L&P and had asked the manager of the store if Poppy could help her load her groceries into her vehicle. The manager agreed and Poppy, along with an unknown male customer, escorted the lady to her car. The lady then related that the group exchanged small talk at the rear of her vehicle as she put her groceries in the trunk. She then recalled looking up and observing a male wearing a ski mask and pointing an AK in their direction. The masked man started shooting Poppy, striking him five times, including three times in the head. Keep in mind, the shooter was using an AK, so you could imagine what kind of damage it did. The gunman then ran back to his vehicle and it drove off. Poppy died three hours later at the Stroger Hospital. The sole gunman on this hit was allegedly T. Roy's younger brother, HK, who would later be called the Headshot King, or Headshot Heck. Another man who allegedly was present on the hit was Mana Duke from Oblock. Many of you have probably seen the video after the murder where HK is smoking with a text on the screen saying, Poppy Wood. Poppy was mocked a lot after the murder, not only because he was TB's best friend but also because of his alleged involvement in the murder of Cheno from Oblock, BJ's brother. The theory says that Cheno shot Poppy's cousin Young from STL slash EBT which made Poppy angry and therefore killed him. However, some people claim it was No Love City who killed him and not Taekwon World. Duke and HK put in the most work for Get Back Gang. Most of you have probably heard the song 12AM by Duke where he raps, Get Back Gang. That's me and heck. What you need to keep in mind is that Taekwon World, Jaro. Mob and STL slash EBT were not moving sloppily during this time even though it may feel that way. Oblock were very good at gathering information and were well organized, many other BD gangs helped them by giving out locations, whereabouts, vehicles and addresses of enemies they were looking for. This is the reason why they could be so successful. Bodies were dropping like flies and OB600 wasn't going to stop. D.B. was totally heartbroken after his day one friend Poppy was shot and killed. D.B.'s former teacher attended Poppy's funeral together with D.B., and that was the last day she saw him. She wrote in a blog that she was mad at him, and was almost shocked when she saw him walk in at Poppy's wake and made some rude noise and muttered some inappropriate words. Terry left quickly that night. As Poppy's funeral ended the next day, the teacher wrote that she knew she had to talk to Terry. 
As she looked at him deep into his eyes and told him she was mad at him, she loved him just the same. Jesus would forgive him, and that he could and should come to North Carolina with her and start his life all over again. He prayed with her. Derry never denied her prayer for him or with him. They hugged, but not for long enough. Both cried as they stood there, mostly for Poppy and for how hard life was, and how your choices don't always feel like an actual choice. She wrote that she knew that DB had lost hope and so she did. I personally think DB knew what was coming, he saw his friend being dropped all around him knowing that it was him they were mainly after. Poppy was only 18 years old when he was murdered. Exactly one month later it was time again. This time it was two bodies that dropped simultaneously in a joint hit signed by 600 and O-Block. Of course, I'm referring to the double murder of Kobe from Taekwon World and FBG Duck's older brother Brick from STL slash EBT, the one who allegedly gave away D-Roy's location to DB and get right. It was in broad daylight on July 17th. 2017 when a FBG Brick and his cousin Kobe Mack were outside in the 6300 block of South St. Lawrence, which is a famous street in the territory of STL slash EBT, and a popular hangout spot for their members. The most likely theory is that OB600 got information on Brick and Kobe's whereabouts, because you don't roll two cars into enemy territory without knowing someone is actually out. I'm convinced they were tipped off by someone that Brick and Kobe were outside, even Brick's mom, Lashina, implied this. Just like I said, members of O Block and 600 got into two cars and drove towards 63rd. They circled the area and split up, one car drove in front of the house and one car parked on 6312 South Rhodes Avenue with members waiting in the back gangway in case one of them would try to escape, which one did. This is also a reason why Lashina said OB600 must have got inside information, because how would they know that one of them would run towards that exact gangway they were waiting in? Now it was time, one white SUV pulled up along the sidewalk in front of the houses, at least one shooter jumped out of the car and shot Kobe nine times, with four of them striking him in the face. Brick instantly started running but the shooter chased him into the gangway, where at least two shooters were waiting. Brick attempted to jump over a gate, but two shooters were waiting for him in the gangway, they shot him six times in total, with one striking him right under the right eye. Some say they shot him while he was attempting to jump the gate, and that the police found him still hanging over the gate, however I don't know if that is true. The OB600 members then jumped back into their vehicles and managed a successful escape. Everything went according to plan for them. Both Kobe, 31, and Brick, 26, were pronounced dead at the scene. There is a tragic photo of FBG Duck comforting his mother Lashina on the scene after the murder. A mother who lost her eldest son, and a brother who lost his older brother, there are probably no words that can describe that sadness and pain. There are many names associated with this hit. There is also different information about how many shooters there were, Duck claimed it was three shooters, but I have also seen family and members claiming it was five. Duck and Brick's mother, Lashina, have stated that C Murder from O Block and Cap Fuck 12 from 600, are two members the police have listed as suspects in the investigation. As you all know, C Murder is also currently facing life in prison for the murder of the younger brother, FBG Duck. Two other names that have also long been mentioned in connection with the double murder are HK and Trey 5 from Oblock. Another name also mentioned that fits the description of Kobe's killer is Makoto from 600. There is a chance that Cap Fuck 12 and Makoto killed Kobe and that HK, Trey 5 and C Murda killed Brick. However, that is just a guess. Munaduke is another name mentioned in connection with the murders mostly because of a picture that was uploaded with him and Cap Fuck 12 later the same day at the balloon drop for Cheno. There is also a possibility that one or two mentioned were not actually present. It is difficult to dot all the names correctly on a hit, in principle almost impossible, then there is always someone that no one thought of. The four names that I personally definitely think were there are Cap Fuck 12, HK, C Murda and Trey 5. This was a huge score for OB600 and just a few days after the murder, E-Dog tweeted, It's going to be a cold-ass summer. 
two months later, RB600 would strike again. This time they would finally get the most wanted, D. Roy's killer, D.B. from Taekwon World. On September 26, 2017, D.B.'s time would sadly come. D.B. was out with side from Jara City in the 7000 block of South Chapel Avenue which is a 3 minute walk from where he dropped D.Roy. I think D.B. would have survived longer if he stopped hanging out in that area, it was not smart of him to be there. Our block knew where to look for him, just as D.Roy knew. Rumors say that HK had tirelessly scoured those very streets in pursuit of D.B. for weeks. September 26, 2017 was the date when the relentless hunt reached its grim conclusion. With intelligence from Pax Town, or Moose Block, RB600 got in traffic, relentlessly chasing TB's whereabouts. They drove to the given location and spotted TB inside, who were sitting on the porch along with two other unidentified individuals. It is then rumored that two of the alleged shooters on the hit, HK and Makado, jumped out of their black four-door vehicle raised their guns and shot both TB and Side multiple times, including the head. According to members, they did TB extra dirty, shooting him 17 times all over the body. To quote one of the officers on the scene who reported on TB's injuries, couple to the head, one to the neck and arm. Witnesses also stated that the shooters reloaded their guns and shot more times. Mac Otto and HK then jumped back into the car and sped away from the scene. D.B., only 21 years old, of the 7,000 block of South Paxton, was pronounced dead at the Northwestern Hospital. Side, however, luckily and miraculously survived the headshot but was sadly killed with motor from Jaro City two years later, allegedly a hit allegedly carried out by Gino from THF 46. Police actually spotted the suspect car speeding away from the scene after the murder. The dispatch reported a four-door black car going in the wrong direction on Chapel, two males, both with masks and that one of them had a light complexion which fits the theory of Makoto being one of the offenders. What is strange is that the dispatch also reported a second vehicle speeding away from the scene together with the black car, a white Dodge Charger. It is thus possible that OB600 came with two cars both circulating the area to find DB and in case something would go wrong. Another one that I'm pretty sure was present at the murder but wasn't shooting is Muwap from Oblock. The day after TB's murder, Makoto uploaded a picture together with HK, both throwing up LA. Just like always when a high-profile member is killed, especially when the member that Oblock was really out looking for was killed, it pours in mockery and disrespectful comments towards the person who was killed. In this case, D.B. When T.B. died, it was also fully confirmed that he was the one who allegedly killed T.Roy. Lil Gerald tweeted several tweets saying, Long live T.Roy Slayer. L.C. from Taekwon World called him Mr. T.Roy Slayer, and that he became a legend after he did that hit, which says a lot about what a big heart and courage, both for good and evil, T.B. had in the streets to take out such a high-profiled member as T.Roy. An interesting detail. The last Facebook post D.B. made, on the morning of September 26th, he wrote, I'm feeling blessed today. Two days later, Fridio from Jaro City was murdered, however, it wasn't Oblock who did it. According to the police report, it was someone who killed Fridio in self-defense. The name of the shooter wasn't disclosed but the fact that it was done in self-defense says everything. Two months later, HK from Oblock, the heart of Get Back Gang who had avenged his brother's death, was killed. Most of you, including myself, thought a few years ago that HK was killed by Wooski and Skinny from Jaro City. This is of course incorrect. What happened is that HK, Mikado and Lil D attempted to rob a 25-year-old man who was in the Parkway Gardens housing complex. However, the man, who was a legal gun owner with a Foyd card, raised his gun and exchanged fire with HK and one of the other two. HK got hit while Lil D and Mikado ran on him. The 25-year-old was not charged with murder since it was considered self-defense. This was a huge loss for Oblock and the mockery of HK came quickly from the other side, just as suspected. Lil Bubba and Richie Jerk from Taekwon World also confirmed HK as the killer of both Poppy and DB by tweeting, 
FHK, long live Biko and Poppy. What's sad is that HK would not have ended up in this situation if it wasn't for his brother's death, and by that I don't mean that he tried to rob someone, but that he became the main killer during the Get Back Gang era. You see, when T-Roy was alive, he did not want that life for HK and forbade him from hanging outside on the block with members or using weapons. Now we enter the year 2018, another eventful year. Just five days into the year, 600 lost a member, Berger. Berger was not killed by any of the enemy 600 have in Chicago, he was killed in a botched robbery in Indiana. He was only 20 years old when he died. Berger was a lesser known member of 600, he rarely gets any praise or mentions from them. Memo is maybe the only one who has mentioned his name in his songs and paid homage. Six months later, 1 June 15, 2018, Get Back Gang would drop another body on STL slash EBT, the one present at the murder of T-Roy. Of course, I'm referring to Mon Mon, or Get Right as he was also called. I understand that there is a lot of controversy surrounding this murder, however, I am sure of my case and won't even bother going into the other theory of Melly from 051 being one of the killers. To me, that theory is unlikely. However, what is likely is that O'Block got Get Right's whereabouts from someone on that side, just like they got Brick and Kobe's whereabouts. Maybe it was 051 Young Money who gave away the location, but the ones pulling the triggers was O'Block. I know many of you are referring to CGR's family saying 051 got him killed, but that doesn't necessarily mean they pulled the triggers. Someone who gives away someone's exact location in order to have that person murdered, is just as guilty of the murder as the shooter, at least that's my opinion, and I think that may also be what CGR's family is referring to. Get Right was standing outside a retail business in the 400 block of East 63rd Street along with other STL members. A car pulled up in the parking lot next to the convenience store. Two shooters, Manaduk and Muwap, jumped out of the car, and started shooting at the people outside the store with CGR as their main target. Duke made CGR stumble and fall to the ground by shooting him several times in the back. What is sad is that Muwap shot and killed a bystander named Troy who happened to be standing next to CGR. Troy was a janitor and was just doing his job when Muwap dropped him. After Muwap had shot the janitor multiple times, he then turned to CGR who Duke had already dropped, and shot him a couple of more times. Both then ran back to the vehicle and sped off from the scene. However, the offender on the left on the surveillance footage, who I believe is Duke, is very lucky to have come out of their unscattered because Rasta from EBT can be seen shooting back and by the looks of it, bullets came flying next to Duke's shoulder and head. Just a few weeks after Duke and Muwap allegedly killed Get Right from STL slash EBT, and the innocent bystander, King Von released his first music video and single, Problems. He started the song by giving a shout out to Get Back Gang. Then he subtly mocked Get Right who recently had been killed by rapping, headshots if you ducking down, then we shoot at the ground, see folks gonna be killing shit, wipe the target and the witnesses. In the song Down Me by King Von, he rapped, Duke and Muwap shoot some, got two fifties, they one hunted. In another song by King Von, 2am, he raps, Muwap did em dirty, now it's hot outside. In an unreleased song by Muwap, he raps, Duke like King Kong, standing over people in their hood. As if this was not enough evidence, Muwap uploaded a story with a picture of him and Duke, with lyrics from 2AM and a text saying, you get the right, I got the left, we gone meet back up. He also posted a picture of him and Duke on Instagram with the caption, you wouldn't even know what type of bond me and this dude got. Picture speaks for itself. In the picture, Duke was posing with his hand as a gun, aiming at the ground. Muwap posed the same but aimed his hand forward. A week after the murder, E-Dog uploaded a picture on Twitter of him. Muwap, Duke, DQ, Gleesh and Youngun with the text, you better get right. Or get left. Another interesting thing is that Duke actually got shot in the leg not too long after CGR was murdered. A few months later after the murder of CGR, 
Get Back Gang dropped another body, this time on Mob. The murder I'm referring to is Dusky, who was killed on October 9, 2018. This was a hit carried out by 600. Dusky was outside in the 5,900 block of South Michigan which is considered mob territory. A car, at least one of the people inside the car started letting shots. Dusky was shot in the head and a 20-year-old woman was struck in the foot. Both were taken to the University of Chicago Medical Center, the woman survived but Dusky who had been hit in the head was tragically pronounced dead. Two names have frequently been mentioned in connection with this murder, and they are, Zhu Blow and Capfuck12 from 600. A year after the murder, Capfuck12 posted a tweet where he wrote, Smoking Dusky cause I know him. Dusky was a known shooter and killer, he had been in several shootouts with enemies of mob, and I'm quite sure he was involved in one or two homicides. Just a few months before his death, he was listed as the main suspect in the murder of Lucy from Lakeside. Lucy was a 14-year-old boy who was dating Dusky's little sister, and had allegedly punched her. Dusky found out about this, and happened to run into Lucy the same day at a gas station. Apparently a fight broke out where Lacey pulled his sister to the ground. They then left the gas station but five minutes later, while driving through mob territory in his Camaro, Dusky spots Lucy and decides to hop out of the car and kill him. Dusky was identified as the shooter by a girl at the scene, but was never charged with the murder, if he was, he would probably have been alive today. The detectives also talked to a person who said that Dusky told him he felt bad about killing the kid, because he didn't know how young he was. The murder of Dusky was followed by a lot of mockery from both 600 and O Block, however, they didn't have time to laugh for long before it slammed in the other direction. Less than 24 hours after Dusky's murder, Mob retaliated on 600 by killing Waldo. On this day, Waldo was out walking on a sidewalk in the 300 block of East 63rd Street, an open field, with nowhere to run or hide and allegedly high as a kite. Suddenly, a blue 2018 Impala pulled up next to him, four people jumped out and fired approximately 22 rounds which hit Waldo all over the body including the head. The shooters then got back into the car and fled westbound, according to authorities. Waldo, who was only 22 years old, was pronounced dead less than 10 minutes after he was shot, according to paramedics. The most famous theory says that this was a joint hit carried out by Mob and Geo Drive. Three names that have been constantly mentioned in connection with this murder are Lil Sean and Lil Boba from Mob, and Graysky from Geo Drive. The three went on and live-streamed on Instagram after the murder, still with hoodies tied up. Lil Sean from Mob was really hurt after the murder of his friend Dusky. He posted several self-incriminating stories on Instagram before and after the murder of Waldo. Among other things, he wrote, Dusky, the sun will shine on us today, on a drive, I take your life, straight homicide, I did enough crying, you know what time it is, and, get his lacking ass, go, followed by a smoke emoji and also tagging Waldo's Instagram page. Waldo was a beloved member of 600, he was also an alleged shooter and killer, his nickname was 4.0. He was also a very disrespectful member, he posted several posts which mocked deceased members such as Lil Jojo and Lil Mark. This mockery was answered after his death, not least by FBG Duck who rapped. He got caught in traffic, Waldo ain't got to finish his status, he on the internet laughing, capping, then got caught without it. What is most incomprehensible to me is that Waldo was out walking the way he did the day after Dusky's murder. That's like asking to be killed, I mean he must have understood how dangerous it was. Even his friend made a Facebook post after his death, saying that he warned Waldo about walking outside like that. Two weeks after the murder of Waldo, Dusky's funeral was shot up. Everybody knows by now that the ricochet that hit Wooski in the head, was fired by one of the guests at the funeral who tried to shoot back at the offenders. Possibly 10 milli from mob. There is also some controversy about who the offenders actually were and which gang they came from. Both 800 and O Block have claimed the shooting heavily on the internet and in songs, not least King Von. 
The only evidence that actually exists regarding the shooting is that King Von was asked about the shooting during an arrest and that the police also believed that the shooter came from Oblock. My personal belief is that it was members of Oblock who were behind it. Now we enter the years 2019, 2020 and 2021, and there are three murders that I want to go over a little quickly. The first is Killa K.I., who was killed on September 13th, 2019. There is a lot of controversy surrounding this murder, some believe that the mob backdoored him, while others believe that it was either a 600 or Front Street that was behind it. It is very difficult to know what is true. However, he was killed on Lil Steve's birthday, which could perhaps mean something. There is also the possibility that someone from his own gang dropped the location to the enemies. The second murder I want to mention is the murder of Dex from Mob, who was killed on May 6th. 2020. Mali from DSG Nico Gang ended up getting arrested for this murder. For those of you who don't know, Nico Gang and 600 are very tight, almost the same thing. Many also believe that 600 were present at this hit, and that it was an act of revenge for the murder of Waldo. The third murder I want to mention is the killing of Senyo from Von World. Senyo was an older member of Von World, who is very tight with Mob, if I remember correctly. Mob was even created by members of Von World. Senyo was killed on March 8, 2021, allegedly by Man Man from Front Street. Here, too, many believe that it was an act of revenge for the murder of Waldo. For those of you who don't know, Waldo had a lot of family in Front Street, it was also there he was killed. Senyo was the person who live-streamed on Instagram the day Dusky died. They were on the block together with several other mob members. You could also see Capfuck12 joining the live stream at the end. Some say that's how he found out their whereabouts. Now we have arrived at the event that everyone has been waiting for. A murder that really shook the whole drill culture. A murder of a rapper who helped put 600 and drill music on the map since the early years. Of course, I'm referring to the murder of the rapper Ide from 600, the older brother of Cide. Ide, whose real name was Cordy Ely, was fatally shot and killed on August 1, 2021, in the 7200 block of South Bennett Avenue. The neighborhood Ide was killed and is considered to be territory of Ghetto World, who were part of the East End Alliance together with Moose Block and Mall Town. The reason why I mention this alliance, is because Mall Town, which I just mentioned as one of the members, is rumored to be behind the murder of Ide. In order to understand this reputation, you also need to understand the relationships and the politics behind it. The fact is that there are several members from East End, mainly from Maltown and Moose Block, who were, and are, cool with members of 051 Young Money and Melly Way which includes gangs such as 757, Geo Drive and Mob. Melly was actually at some point living in Maltown territory, and was cool with several of the members. Nooch who was killed in July 2022, was one of the members who were cool with both Melly and Drilla from 051YM. Nooch was also part of the Mali Way movement, who is at war with Taekwon World for killing Melly in September 2019. Nooch's relationship with 757 also stems from the fact that he originated from 035, before the 757 alliance, then called Jamar World which was created after Jamar from Lawless was killed in 2010 by Outlaw City and South Sea. Another individual who was very close with Melly was Ducky, also known as Lil D, from Mall Town who was killed by Pax Town in 2020 while live streaming on Facebook. Ducky Way was created in his honor. The theory that Mall Town killed Ida stems from these relationships, since their allies are bitter enemies of 600. However, Ide was not killed in Mall Town, he was killed in Ghetto World, who were not part of the Mali Way movement. According to Breezy from 600, Ide visited a woman in what he thought was non-op territory that day in August. The theory that Ide visited a woman seems to be correct, because according to the incident report, Ide pushed the woman away as soon as the shots started flying in the air. According to the report, there were two offenders that jumped out of a gold Buick SUV and started shooting at Ide. As I said, the woman got shoved away from danger by Ide. He then tried to crawl under a car for cover, 
But once the shooters had ran back to their car, and sped away from the scene, Ide had been shot 22 times all over his body. Ide sustained 9 shots to the right flank, 1 to the butt cheek, 2 to the right mid-back, 2 to the right thigh, 1 to the right shoulder, 2 to the right upper abdomen, 2 to the inner right thigh, 2 to the right forearm, and 1 to the right upper arm. It was a dirty kill. It was also clear that it was Ide who was the target of the shooting, nobody else. Who actually pulled the trigger is unknown, but the theory is that they were from Mall Town. However, this is not the only theory that exists. A few years ago I received information that it was Paxtown that killed D-Day while sliding on East End, and that they targeted him because of their good relationship with Jaro City and Taekwon World. However, I'm not sure if I believe that theory, it seems a little bit stretched. There are also those who believe that Ide was set up by somebody, possibly the woman he was accompanied with. There is of course also a probability that somebody from East End, with loyalty to Maliway, gave away Ide's location to Mob, or any other gang a part of the Maliway movement. What is difficult in connection with big profiles like Ide being murdered, is that there are very many gangs who want to claim it, even if they were not involved. There is also a lot of information coming out, and sometimes it can be difficult to distinguish what is false or true. At the end of the day, it's incredibly sad that Chicago lost such a big profile as Ide. He was one of my favorite rappers from the old Drill era, he had classics such as War, and 600. Rest in peace Ide. Now this story is coming to an end but before I finish I want to tell you about two more things, the death of Boss Moo and Makoto. Both high-profile members of 600. Boss Mu passed away on September 10, 2021. On this day, Boss Mu first killed his girlfriend and then killed himself. According to information, he did this due to mental health issues. The girl was found with multiple gunshot wounds to her body and Boss Mu had shot himself in the head. This did not occur in Chicago, it happened in Los Angeles. Makoto on the other hand, was found dead in his cell in the county. According to sources, there is a type of drug in the county that has gotten people hooked recently. Apparently it is called K2 and you smoked it off paper. According to sources, Makoto died of an overdose. As many of you already know, Makoto was fighting a double homicide together with Lil Scud from O Block who had already been sent to 26 years in prison for the two murders. The double homicide occurred in June 2017. The two victims were two women, both mothers. Their names were Juliet, 42, and Janine, 32. This was the last part of the story of D. Rose and 600. I apologize that it took time to get it out but the reason is the fake copyright issues the channel has been subjected to. I appreciate your support.